All right. We sort of went through the end of the Gospels last week. I know it's kind of quick. Um, and honestly, if, if there's something you'd like to, to get back into, that, that would certainly be fair game. Um, from the last days of Jesus' life on earth. Any, any holdovers, any uh, favorites that we just kind of skimmed through that you'd like to bring back to us tonight? All right, let's go to Acts then. Basically, um, the first third or so, a little over, of, of Acts, sort of back in familiar territory, I would think. We probably study Acts more than we study anything else. Is, is, that, is that still fair to say? Um, I, uh, I slowed down on making new notes as I went through Acts, but I couldn't, I couldn't help but notice in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus gathered them together, verse 3 or 4, and commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. And it was fresh on my mind that all of the resurrection accounts the women were given instructions. You tell the disciples to get to Galilee. Did you notice that? Was that just like in your face? That we kept reading, kept reading, kept reading. And almost none of the resurrection accounts happened in Galilee. In fact, when we got to John and, and it said this was his third appearance, well, we know the first one was the first Sunday night and the second one was the second Sunday night because that's Thomas. And if that's the third one, they did get to Galilee. But 40 days... On the earth, uh, that's seven. That's, that's all the appearances we have. And then we start reading ascension accounts. And yet, when we get to Acts, it's like we've always been in Jerusalem almost. I don't know. If you hadn't read John 21, you might miss the whole Galilee request. I've, Jesus predicted and then told the women and then told the disciples I'm going to meet you in Galilee. You know, if I told you I was going to meet you somewhere and, and you were three days walk south of that for a week, I, I would think you weren't taking me seriously, you know? If I told you to meet me in Galilee and you were still in Jerusalem. But Thomas is still trying to sort out if he even believes he's around. So it's like Jesus, whatever plan he had in Galilee, whatever reason he had, I'm sure just to get away from the authorities and all the, he just wanted that time with the disciples, um, it's like he almost had to go to plan B to get them on the page with him. And yet, Luke uses this term, gathering them together. Were they still, were they still kind of at loose ends at, at this point? And I mean, this is the ascension account that we're reading in Acts chapter 1. So he tells them, you know, stay in Jerusalem, uh, until you receive the promise from the Father, and they got questions off, off the walls. You gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? After 40 days, we're having this question, really? 40 days after the resurrection, we're having the we don't understand what in the world you were here for question? Because that's not what he came to do, and he never said he would. But the question is asked, and he doesn't answer it. He says, you don't, it's not for you to know the time. Doesn't say, that's not what I'm going to do. He says, it's not for you to know the times. Acts 1 has always been a, a curiosity to me. And the other notes that I wrote had to do with uh, the replacement of Matthias. Of course, we read the psalm uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, his office another man take and if you remember reading that psalm you were you were kind of reading along and and you might have even missed it because it it's like that phrase is just like out of the middle of a different com context completely 
and it's almost like David's talking about something else. Obviously, he's not talking about replacing an apostle. And yet Peter goes to this psalm and says, okay, we got we to gotta do the right thing here and exercises this leadership when they're in this waiting period and they take an action and they get the, the number back up to 12. And as some commentators point out, did, did Jesus ever ask them to do this? Was there, was there any prompting for Peter to really do this? We don't hear from Matthias ever again. So apparently it wasn't like a Paul thing, right? Because we hear about Paul like for the rest of the New Testament. So it, it, Acts 1 has got some enigmas in it. And uh, not to say that the other chapters don't, but the struggle, the outline of the book is in verse 8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the earth. And we're going to do Jerusalem for almost all of our reading uh, this, this past week. We're still in Jerusalem in, uh, well, when we go to Damascus with, with Saul, we leave Jerusalem. But he's got letters from Jerusalem, right? So we're tethered back to Jerusalem. And what he wants to do is tethered back to Jerusalem. And, it, and it's not really until we finally get to chapter 10 that, that Peter has his vision and, and we kind of break through into the Gentiles. It's a, it's a slow process. So I guess my, uh, my reflection on this part of Acts, as, uh, and, it, and it sort of goes for the last part of uh, Jesus' life on earth as he sort of pulled the disciples along. I mean, you know, <laughs> they, they were so much there was so much misunderstood um, fear was something he didn't want them to have but it but it dominated their hearts they they ran from the garden peter denied the lord you know obviously judas betrayed him um, there was a lot of real unsettled action if you read the last stories of jesus and you started acts thinking we're going to use those same guys you know Jesus, could you put this on hold for six months and recruit some other guys? I'm sure in six months you could get them to where these guys are. So what's the difference? The, the theme of Acts, what's the difference in the disciples we read about in, in the last two chapters of, of the Gospels and the disciples we read about in chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8, and 10? Holy Spirit. Jesus says, go and wait, and you'll receive, you'll receive the power you need. And he's already told them, don't worry about what to say. It'll be giving you in that hour what to say. So really, <clears throat> I won't go so far as to say we're going to use the shell of the disciples and God's going to get it done anyway, because that just discounts any growth on their part at all. But the, the growth was certainly accelerated, was it not? I mean, Peter in Acts 2 doesn't look anything like Peter in John 21. Mr. <clears throat> you know I love you, you know, quit asking me. <laughs> He's standing up there saying, you killed the Messiah. You need to repent. Where'd that come from? You know, where'd this boldness and all this command of Scripture that he exercises in Acts chapter 2 come from? Except the Spirit and the the massive growth that God can do when we, when we truly surrender our agenda, which they clearly had, you know, Acts chapter 1. We, we'd like for you to take care of the Romans now, you know. When you surrender that agenda and say, okay, God, what do you want to do? And then God gets to do what he wants to do. It goes faster and it goes better. No question. Do you have any Questions that came up as you read these chapters? I'm yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Right.
They were confused when he was there, but then he left. And so they're really confused. And so we really, really, really need the Spirit to clear this up. Yeah. Yeah, they got to work. The contrast between the Peter who, who can't even talk to a slave girl over a fire at, an, at night and standing in front of the very body that condemned Jesus and killed him, the contrast is way night and day because he just says, well, okay, we, we must obey God rather than men. That's what we're going to tell you. And let's say, you're the men. <laughs> it, it's just in their face. And, you know, Jesus didn't really do that with them. I mean, he said some things boldly, but he was quiet mostly. And Peter is very combative and confrontive and accusing, if you will, under God's direction, I think. You know, it's a whole different person. Good, that's a good point. So do you think that the disciples had to experience the lack of Jesus in order to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? I'm, I'm just, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not, I'm not going to do the last two days readings. I'm not going to do Song of Solomon and Psalm 19. That, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say something about that, but uh, we're going to do some stuff because we've got, what, 20 Psalms and three Proverbs or something besides that. Um, so, uh, if you want to, let's go back to uh, Psalm 108. And we'll uh, kind of get a little bit of the flow here. I had a sense that as, as we're in this part of Psalms, uh, they're, they're much more similar. What, what themes do you hear most often out of, you know, from Psalm 108 to Psalm 145, really. If it's David, what's he asking for or, or talking about? His enemies, deliverance, and then praise to God for taking care of his enemies <laughs> and, and giving him the, the blessings and the things that he needs. It's, it's a... It's pretty amazing. Um, in my in my view, there's more there's more consistency, um, and and where he does go into some of the stuff we talked about last Sunday night, like Psalm 109, where he, you know, talks about what he hopes God will do to his enemies. Um, there's a little less of that in in the rest of this part of the the Psalms. A lot more times that David was just grateful to have God and to be able to rely on him. And the other, the theme word that I think I read virtually in every psalm is that word for mercy that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Loving kindness is the New American Standard word. Uh, he's going he's gonna to extol God's loving kindness, God's mercy, his hesed, um, in virtually every one of these. And, and that is the steadfast love of the Lord that we just sang about. That's, that's the same phrase. Um, the, the theme is, um, is strong in, in, my, in my experience in, in these particular psalms. I wrote um, Psalm 1. I'm, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I skipped what I wanted to say about Psalm 108. He calls for deliverance and victory in the name of God's loving kindness. It's, it's, uh, it's a theme, yes, but it's like, okay, your loving kindness is, is the rule of my life. And so because that exists, I want to ask for deliverance. Because that exists, I know you're, you're there. Because that exists, I want to exalt you, verse 4 or 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Does that ring a bell? Anybody? That's a song. 
um, the mention of these other places and armies um, also in David's world it wasn't just Israel and and the other nations were constantly a, a challenge and a, and a hindrance to him and yet David does not see that God is just in Israel and it would be great if all the other nations had God in them it's like no God's over there too and and he's been dealing with them too you know he took care of us when Balaam came against us and prophesied against us and he's gonna take care of us uh, whether whether our king is is in that land or not he's he's uh, God is still in charge we mentioned how 109 and 110 are such contrasts with 109 you know talking about what he hopes he'll do to his enemies and that 110 is the psalm of uh, quoted in uh, Acts 2 uh, the psalm of coronation some call it where uh, Jesus is is clearly in place I went down through 111 through 18 and I I just I found myself finding all kinds of songs in here for one thing and maybe maybe you notice several of those but this is my short list just a phrase in each psalm 1 111 prays for all of God's goodness 112 blessings to those who fear the Lord and the blessing when I say blessings it's like this verse is one blessing and this verse is another one and this verse is another one and you know it's like a, a laundry list of blessings from the rising of the sun to the setting uh, of the same may the name of the Lord be praised you remember that song have you heard that song we haven't heard it we don't sing it much here um, who is like who is like the Lord who's like him 114 this uh, psalm of deliverance from Egypt and mentions water coming from the rock that there was a pool of water from a from a rock how do you get water in a rock how does that how does that happen well we know Moses uh, struck the rock the uh, psalm about idolatry that uh, that lists all the things that idols can't do and basically it goes down every one of our body parts and says well they don't have a brain they can't think they don't have eyes they can't see they don't have ears they can't hear <laughs> except for that they're real good I guess I don't know what they're good for you know it's it's a really kind of a mocking psalm idols are nothing like the Lord because he's got all of those things of course we're made in God's image so when you list all of our physical attributes you're seeing things that God can do because we are made like him 116 is a call for deliverance from death 117 is the shortest psalm of all the basis for the song that we have sung oh praise the Lord all ye peoples so that's a, a beautiful all of that whole psalm song comes out of those three phrases in that short psalm and then 118 give thanks to the Lord for his good another song and the mention verse 22 of the stone which builders rejected uh, so many quotes uh, that that find their way in the New Testament from uh, many of these Psalms particularly in this section of the what they call the Psalter my favorite is probably 127 unless the Lord builds the house they labor in vain who build it and then of course he talks about children being a heritage or a gift from the Lord they're a reward they're a blessing um, he doesn't really mention the part about them being a pain when they leave their toys out but I guess that's something I can add to my experience but um, beautiful beautiful psalm that uh, you, you know you you've read for a long time by the time you get to 127 and then there it is um, the other section that we read was 138 139 143 through 145 and I I found myself the last several certainly the last five I think or six uh, Psalms are praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord right um, and we're starting to see that dawn in uh, Psalm 145 
but we have in 143 cries for deliverance in one psalm and then in the next one it's it's still wanting deliverance but there's all kinds of praise listed in there and I, I wondered sometimes if if what David was experiencing is well you know my enemies look like they're going to get me so I'm going to I'm going to really cry out to God you know and then it looks better and it looks like he's going to be okay and so he gets real praise uh, full of praise for God and and of course God does deliver him and so then he just breaks out in uh, full praise and not really a lot of plea and crying and and worrying at all and you kind of see that progression in 143 through 145. To go backwards, Psalm 139 is the one that speaks of how intimately acquainted, God, you are with all my ways. You laid your hand on me. You know, feel the hand of God on your back as you feel on your face, facing the hard things that you're facing. And where can I go from your spirit? Search me and try me. And several songs that that phrase in verses 23 through 24 did you have any favorites in these sections of psalms that you want to throw out all right let's look at psalm i'm sorry proverbs 23 and 24 and i'll make one more mention of uh psalms and that's that's what we'll do tonight proverbs 23 um i i wrote down these themes and i really really found myself saying wow this is contemporary this is the stuff that's going on right now um lots of verses about the fleeting nature of wealth and, and all the ways, you know, you think you're going to go sit with the ruler and you're going to have wealth. And, oh, that didn't go well. Um, then you're going to get around a selfish person. He looks like he'd be good for wealth because, you know, he's never given up anything he ever possessed. So he's got a lot. No, that's not a, that's a dead end street. How about the foolish? How about sinners, verse 17? And then he just goes into the, the full mockery of what alcohol does to a human being. And that... Uh, that's a classic. <laughs> makes it makes a fool out of of me. That's what that's what good it is. And it's like Solomon is trying to warn us not to look at things other than God for the things that that we think would make our life better. And and we we certainly are tempted to do that all the time, no doubt. The last two things I'd like to mention in Proverbs, Proverbs 24, 17. Um, sounds like it came from the New Testament. If you've been listening to Lindell, you know that's not true because you know that the Old Testament had the same thoughts. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles or... The Lord will see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from him. He's going to be displeased with the fact that you're gloating that your enemy is suffering. <laughs> That's, that, that kind of sounds like if your enemy is hungry, give him food, you know, from, from Romans. And a similar in verse... Uh, well, really, 20, 28 and 29, don't be a witness against your neighbor without cause or deceive with your lips. Do not say, thus I shall do to him as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. I'm going to give him what he deserves. Those aren't words for people who follow God to say about fellow human beings, according to Solomon. And frankly, as I read the Old Testament, certainly as we read these Psalms that talk about how rough it is in David's world, um, those are those sound kind of New Testament agape love oriented rather than what we think the Old Testament's really about, and obviously it isn't. I just had a question this morning. Uh, someone who'd read Psalm one nineteen. If if for whatever reason you didn't do that yesterday, 
I want to tell you what you're going to what you're going to encounter. Um, the question was, what what are all those words at the top of these psalms? So one Psalm 119 is 176 verses, which is a numerical reality that there are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and there is a section for each letter of the alphabet. So the first one says Aleph, which is the letter A. And then it goes on to the, you know, B, and except it's not identical to our alphabet, obviously, 22 instead of 26. But the, what we don't realize as we're reading is, and we say, oh, these, these sound an awful lot alike. But if you were a Hebrew student and you were reading this in Hebrew, you would be reading similar message but every one of the 11 verses down the side would be starting with the letter A. It's, it's, a, it's an acrostic kind of, except these 11 verses are A, and these are B, and these are C, and on down to the end of the alphabet. And so, you know, we're reading in English, and you think, oh, I've read that before. Yeah, but he started it with that letter. <laughs> and it, it is a, it's a literary masterpiece from the standpoint of the Hebrew. And, and what you're what you're reading is, does sound fairly similar, as certainly as you read 22 times 11. Uh, they begin to start sounding similar uh, to each other, a lot of themes that, that come. But, but bear that in mind and be aware that that's what's at the top of your uh, psalm as, as you start each section. That's the letter of the alphabet. Okay? How long did it take to write that? Ooh. I just kind of think all of his life. I, I just, you know, sometimes I just think that's, he just worked on that for years. That was one he had in his back pocket when he was out in the field. You know, I found another A. <laughs> and I, and I, and I don't want to sound like it's, it's identical because it's not there. I mean, it's 176 verses. There are a lot of different thoughts and themes in, in that whole thing. In fact, all of, what else we see in Psalms is pretty much in that Psalm. But you do see recurring themes and remember that in its language it starts with a different letter. All right. Well, thanks. Don't skip Song of Solomon, especially if you're married. That's all I'm going to say about that. We're going to sing a song and if uh, there's something you'd like to be prayed about before we exit tonight. Please let us know, and I'll I'll be watching for that. Let's sing. <laughs>